In spring of 2011, we had very severe stratospheric ozone depletion. We were right there uh, in Eureka and um, the chemistry uh, that, was, that was destroying ozone was kind of more or less right overhead. But we could compare those with measurements that had been done at Eureka for the previous 15 years. And so we had you know, a fairly nice baseline to show that um, the, the ozone depletion that year was at a record low level and some of the chlorine compounds, actually compounds that are involved in, in chemistry were also abnormally low. But the stratosphere was unusually um, stable and, and very cold that winter. And so the chemistry that leads to ozone depletion relies on very low temperatures. And that's why we tend to have an Antarctic ozone hole, but not an Arctic ozone hole, because the temperatures in Antarctica get much colder because the conditions in the winter are just much more stable than they are in the northern hemisphere. Greenhouse gases are trapping more heat in the lower atmosphere, but in fact that's actually cooling the stratosphere. And so if temperatures in the stratosphere are colder, some of the chemical reactions that destroy ozone um, will, will tend to slow down. And so in fact, we expect kind of globally that that will help ozone recovery. On the other hand, if the stratosphere gets colder in the polar regions, so in the Arctic and the Antarctic, if it's, if it's colder in the stratosphere, then the conditions that lead to ozone depletion in the spring will be enhanced. And so we may see more uh, ozone depletion in, in the polar regions in the springtime. This is, so this is kind of two competing effects. My research involves doing measurements of atmospheric composition. So we use a variety of different uh, instruments and techniques to measure gases in the atmosphere. So those measurements are of, of things like greenhouse gases, so carbon dioxide, methane, nitrous oxide. Um, we also do measurements of ozone and gases related to ozone chemistry. And we also measure pollutants in the atmosphere, things related to air quality. The end goal is to try to understand um, you know, what gases do we have in the atmosphere, how are the concentrations um, changing with, with time, with location, and trying to understand the, the underlying kind of chemistry and, and physics uh, that determines uh, the amount of gas in the atmosphere. Uh, we do measurements at a lab on Ellesmere Island called PEARL, the Polar Environment Atmospheric Research Lab. And there we have a suite of about two dozen different instruments that do measurements of the atmosphere from the ground to roughly 100 kilometers. And so we're measuring a wide variety of different uh, atmospheric variables there, temperatures, uh, winds, uh, aerosols, clouds, and tr trace gases. So the gases that you measure, are they normally from a local source, or are they transported long distances? Uh, what's the difference? Well, one of the advantages of living in the satellite age is that we really can see you know, how gases are emitted and then transported around the globe. And so, for example, back in, in 1999, uh, NASA launched a satellite called Terra, and one of the instruments on that is an instrument called Moffat, which was actually developed uh, here in, in Canada by Professor Jim Drummond. And so Moffat was really one of the first instruments to measure carbon monoxide, which is a pollutant. It's, it comes from, from fossil fuels, it has a number of different uh, sources. And carbon monoxide has a fairly long lifetime of several months. And so that means that when it's emitted in the atmosphere, it sticks around for a while. And that means that you can really see um, how it's being transported. And so there are these beautiful movies from Moffat that kind of show you kind of in a time-lapse way um, how you know, carbon monoxide being emitted from you know, Los Angeles Basin gets trans uh, transported across the states and eventually over to Europe. Big emissions in Western Europe get, get transported over, um, over uh, Russia and into, into Asia. Emissions from China, they get transported across the Pacific, and with, with these kinds of measurements that we can see from satellites, you can really see these transport pathways where you know, pollutants emitted in one part of the globe very clearly get transported elsewhere. It circles the globe, and so that it affects the global atmosphere. So the emissions of CO2 from Ontario, from some part of China, from some part of Russia, Africa, they're all mixed together. They all contribute based on how much we put up there. And the result is the climate is changing. The climate is already warming at about 0.2 degrees C per decade for the last 25 years. It's projected to continue that way because of this very long lifetime of the CO2 in the atmosphere. We know how greenhouse gas molecules work. We know how they like to move. And we know how they interact with radiation. So it's, it's pretty basic science that says if you're putting more of those molecules in the atmosphere, they're going to absorb more radiation. Treating the atmosphere like a big black box, it's going to, that black box is going to heat up. 